Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on managing for the Master till he comes. It's a series about our stewardship. That's a, an old term we don't use very often. But what is our responsibilities to the Lord and to the Church? This particular lesson is lesson number three in that series for January 21 of uh, 2023, entitled The Tithing Contract. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come now to talk about what it means to work with you, alongside you, that you have asked us to, what you've asked us to do to have that wonderful cooperation that is available to us and the blessings that are connected with it. Help us to understand it more clearly uh, than ever is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's review some stories from the Bible, early history of tithing, and see what we can learn. Jim? From the Bible study guide, in Genesis 14, Abraham had returned from a successful hostage rescue mission in which he had saved his nephew Lot, Lot's family, and the other people taken from Sodom. The king of Sodom was so grateful for the rescue that he offered Abram all the spoils of, his ba of the battle. Abram not only refused the offer, but also gave a tithe of all his possessions to Melchizedek. Immediately after Abram's tithing experience, the Lord said, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Genesis 15, 1 from the New King James Version. In effect, the Lord was telling Abram, Don't worry, I will be your protector and provider. Then, much later, Moses told Israel as they were about to enter Canaan, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces every year, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Deuteronomy 14, 22 from the NKJV. And that's from our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide. Ellen White wrote, Carrie? Men were required to offer to God gifts for religious purposes before for the definite system was given to Moses even as far back as the days of Adam. That's from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, 393, Paragraph 1. Okay, so those are interesting introductions. What does all this mean for us today? Do you think that these examples and this contract with God given at the very end of the Old Testament, uh, as recorded in Malachi 3.10, might still apply to us in our day? If so, can we depend on God's promise even today? Some who are familiar with the stories of the Bible might wonder what a tithe is, or people who are unfamiliar, uh, yeah, what a tithe is. Tithe is an old English word for one-tenth or 10%. God is asking that we return to him 10% of our increase for the support of the church and the ministerial staff. Scholars have estimated that the average Israelite if he followed all the d uh, directions that God gave for the support of the Levites in the temple, was expected to give nearly 25% of his increases to the Lord. However, we need to be honest that that 25% really included all government expenses, what we call taxes, as well as religious expenses. So today that would include our taxes as well as our tithes and offerings. Um, so why would we say that they're things they had to pay for were uh, taxes? What did they do? Why would it be considered taxes? It was for the, it was for the nation. Okay. For the king. For the king, or when there was a king, and it was for the Levites, who even from the days of Moses were supposed to be the governing group that took charge of the judging, took, car, took charge of Say, is dealing with cases and what all kinds of government activities were handled by the Levites. So it was a sort of government kind of thing. There were some interesting provisions in the law. 
if for some reason an animal, and what they did is they would run these an their animals through a chute, uh, one animal at a time, and they would go one, two, three, four, five, six, and number 10 was to be the, the tithe. These, of course, were the, presumably the new animals. Uh, and if, if, for, if it had particular value to the owner, that number 10 won, and if he desired to retain that animal, he could pay an additional 20% and ask to keep that animal. Now, I'm not quite sure how you pay 20% of an animal. Anybody figured that one out? You give two other animals. Probably something like that. Maybe for their hide to make clothes or something. Yeah, from the second animal. Well, Gordon, from Leviticus 27. One-tenth of all the produce of the land whether grain or fruit belongs to the Lord. If a man wishes to buy any of it back, he must pay the standard price plus an additional 20%. One out of every 10 domestic animals belongs to the Lord. When the animals are counted, every 10th one belongs to the Lord. From the Good News Bible. Okay, when word reached Abram slash Abraham that his nephew Lot and his family along with all the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah and several of the other small towns had been conquered and had been taken hostage by the invading army, Abraham gathered 318 of his trained soldiers, and we've talked about this before. What was the purpose? Why did Abraham have 318 trained soldiers? He was a big operation, you might call it. He, he was a huge operation, and he needed those, those soldiers to protect his crop, I mean, his, his flocks and herds and so forth. And his people. And his people. Yes. With the help of several of his associates, Abraham marched after the invaders. He caught up with them near Damascus and attacked at night, completely defeating them. They recovered almost all the goods belonging to the people who had lived in the Jordan Valley. After allowing the inhabitants to return to their homes and restoring to them as much as possible their property, Abraham still was left with a lot of loot. As he traveled from Jericho up to the north of Jerusalem where he was living, Melchizedek, whose name means the King of Righteousness and also known as the King of Peace, ruled in Jerusalem. So when Melchizedek saw Abraham coming, he offered to provide bread and wine for his weary soldiers. He blessed Abraham, who gave him one-tenth of all the loot that he had acquired. So, that's a, and a couple things about that. We know exactly what happened to the tithe in this case. What did Abraham do with it? Gave it to Melchizedek. He gave it to Melchizedek. We're going to find some other cases where we don't know what they did with the tithe. Paul had some interesting thoughts on that whole story. In Hebrews 7, 1 to 10, we read, this Melchizedek was king of Salem, which was an earlier name for Jerusalem, and a priest of the Most High God. And you wonder, if he was a priest of the Most High God, does that mean that many of the people in Jerusalem back in those days were actually worshiping the true God? As Abraham was coming back from the battle in which he defeated the four kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of all he had taken. The first meaning of Melchizedek's name is King of Righteousness, and the, because he was King of Salem, his name also means King of Peace. There's no record of Melchizedek's father or mother or any of the, his ancestors, no record of his birth or of his death. He is like the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. You see then how great he was. Abraham, our famous ancestor, gave him a tenth of all he got in the battle. And those descendants of Levi who are priests are commanded by the law to collect a tenth from the people of Israel, that is, from their own people, even though they are also descendants of Abraham. Melchizedek was not a descendant from Levi, but he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him, the man who received God's promises. There is no doubt that the one who blesses is greater than the one who is blessed. In the case of the priests, the tenth is collected by men who die, but as for Melchizedek, the tenth was collected by one who lives, as the scripture says. And, so to speak, when Abraham paid the tenth, Levi, whose descendants collected the tenth, also paid it. That's a long explanation there. Um, and we generally would say that, okay, Levi was a great-grandson of Abraham, and so, in a, in a sense anyway, through Abraham, he was paying tithe. And, of course, later, when we talk about the Israelites, it was the Levites who were supposed to collect the tithe. 
It is interesting to note in Paul's discussion that neither Melchizedek nor Jesus Christ were of the tribe of Levi. Melchizedek was not even a descendant of Abraham. Some critics of the tithing system and of the church in general try to suggest that tithing is an outdated Jewish custom and that it does not apply to us at the present time. This story proves that this tithing system was established way before the birth of Levi or the giving of any of the Hebrew laws which were given at the time of the Exodus. Another story about tithing involves Jacob. When he was fleeing from his home because of the wrath of his brother, he slept one night using a stone pillow and had a dream. Jim? From Genesis chapter 28, verses 13 and 14 and 20 to 22. And there was a Lord standing beside him. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac. He said, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. They will be as numerous as the specks of the dust on the earth. They will extend their territory to in all directions and through you and your descendants, I will bless all nations. Then Jacob made a vow to the Lord. If you will be with me and protect me on the journey I am making and give me food and clothing, and if I th return safely to my father's home, then you will be my God. This memorial stone, which I have set up by the place where you are worshiped, and I will give you a tenth of everything you give me. Good news Bible. Okay, so to whom did Jacob pay his tithe? It's not defined in the Bible. We are not told is the correct, yeah, like you said. This tithing system was designed by God even before there was a recognized priesthood to which the tithes could be given. We know what Abraham did with his tithe, he gave it to Melchizedek. But we have no idea what Jacob did with the tithe that he planned to pay. Did he give it to the poor? That was not really what tithing is supposed to be for. Do these events involving Abram, Abraham, and Jacob have any binding relationship to us and our God today? Or do this, these are just interesting old stories? Carrie, you want to read to us about what it says in Malachi 3.10? Now let's talk about this for a moment. Malachi is the last book in our Protestant, Protestant really, uh, Bible of the Old the Testament. Old Testament. Yeah. the Old Testament. And it was written in a time, this was after the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, shortly after Ezra and Nehemiah, a time when there was all sorts of craziness going on. And then Ezra and Nehemiah had pulled things together and, and, and really revived things and rebuilt a sort of temple and so forth. And now already, as you can read, if you read the whole book of Malachi, they were doing all sorts of things that weren't supposed to be doing. So God responded with regard to tithing the following words. Malachi 3.10, Kerry. The Lord said, bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in abundance all kinds of things from the Good News Bible. So how many of the people in Malachi's day do you think took advantage of that? We don't know. Yeah. But it's quite a promise, an incredible promise, really. Could it really be true even today? Could we claim this promise? Are we as bad, evil as the people to whom it was made in 425 BC? Why do you think God made that promise to them? You think, um, I mean, was this a way of saying, please come back, please you know, do what you're supposed to be doing? This is not something new, but obviously they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So just a matter of trying to clarify, where is that storehouse that Malachi 3 talked about? The Hebrews recognized that the temple or slash storehouse was the sanctuary that was built out in the desert at the foot of Mount Sinai. Of course, that was a long time before Malachi. Later, when they were in the Promised Land, it was replaced by a central location, which was first at Shiloh, and then more prominently at the temple in Jerusalem. 
So what does this teach us about what we should do with our tithes? Should we take it to Jerusalem? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 14 from, from the Good News Bible says, Out of the territory of all your tithes, the Lord will choose the one place where the people are to come into his presence and worship him. There you are to offer your sacrifices that are to be burnt and your other sacrifices, your tithes and your offerings, the gifts that you promise to the Lord, your free will offerings and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep. There in the presence of the Lord your God who has blessed you, you and your family will eat and enjoy the good things that you have worked for. Let me interrupt for just a second. If you give the firstborn of all your cattle and sheep, what percentage of your income is that going to amount to? Could be a lot more than 50, a lot more than 10%. A lot more than 10%, that's right. And as far as that part of your income, and that doesn't allow for you know, the, the wheat and the oats and the barley and whatever, whatever you could grow on, in the land, but that's a pretty major contribution in terms of, of animals. If it's a tenth of your elephants, then, you know, elephants reproduce, what, every two years, if that? Yeah, right. So it's... At best. Gonna be a while. Okay. Continuing with uh, verse, verse eight. eight. When that time comes, you must not do as you have been doing. Until now, you have all been worshiping as you please, because you have not yet entered the land that the Lord your God is giving you, where you can live in peace. Okay, so now I'm going to interrupt, interrupt again for a this second. This was in the wilderness. Yeah, this is Deuteronomy. So we're talking about, this was written and spoken to my Moses in the land of Moab, across from Jericho, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So, I mean, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they're still worshiping how they plan, just how they wanted to? I mean, this was... The, the tabernacle was made, where was the tabernacle made? Sinai. At the foot of Sinai, at the beginning of the 40 years. You would think this was the most regimented time that they would have. I mean, they're all traveling together, camping mm -hmm. together, uh, eating together, probably have manna yeah. together, and get water from, from the Lord. Until now you have all been worshiping as you please. Well, go ahead, number nine. So, verse 9, because you have not yet entered the land that the Lord your God is, is giving you, where you can live in peace, when you cross the river Jordan, the Lord will let you occupy the land and live there. He will keep you safe from all your enemies, and you will live in peace. At least for a while they would. Yeah. The Lord will choose a single place where he has to be worshipped. And there you must bring to him everything that I have commanded, your sacrifices that are to be burnt, and your other sacrifices, your tithes and your offerings, and those special gifts that you have promised to the Lord. Be joyful there in his presence, together with your children, your servants, and the Levites who live in your towns. Remember that the Levites will have no land of their own. You are not to offer your sacrifices wherever you choose, you must offer them only in the one place that the Lord will choose in the territory of one of your tribes. Only there are you to offer your sacrifices that are to be burnt and do all the other things that I have commanded you. Now, this is interesting. If you stop and think about it, how often were most of the people coming to the temple? How often in a year? Well, I mean, even three times. Yeah. And yeah. so... If you want to offer a sin offering, you have to bring it to the temple. So that means you're allowed to sin three times a year? <laughs> I don't think that was supposed to be the message. But, I mean, that's, he makes it very clear. And why do you suppose he said, you've got to come just at this one place? Why would he require that? Well, we know what they did later. They were sacrificing on all kinds of hills and in the forests and so on and so forth. So exactly. He so wanted to make it difficult for them to sacrifice. You have to travel maybe a hundred miles, two hundred miles to, to offer a sacrifice. Don't do it every week. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly not every day. Yeah, that wasn't supposed to be the message. 
Well, if you go to Leviticus, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 1, I think in verse 2, if you're going to bring sacrifices, yeah. follow this procedure. Not that he wants sacrifices, but if you're going to do it, yeah. he knew that they were a bunch of pagans anyway, so... When possible, the Hebrews were to travel three times a year to Jerusalem to take their sacrifices and tithes and to worship in the temple sanctuary. These were the times of Passover, Pentecost, 50, year, 50 days later, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which happened in what we would consider to be the fall, also known as the Day of Atonement, as a part of that. Traditionally, the Jews were to carry their tithes with them at that time and hand them over to the authorities in the temple, who would in turn distribute them to the Levites, who had no land territory assigned to them, which is not completely true. They had cities. They had cities and a small garden, small garden areas around the cities, so they had some land. This was the, uh, this was the designated plan for the support of the Levites who ministered to the people as the religious leaders and as their political, military, and civic, civil leaders. So these times when the Israelites were carrying their tithes to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. these three times a year, what a time for, for robbers, you know? Yeah. Let's, let's wait until then, and then we can take advantage. Everyone will have money then. Think so. And what about, I mean, who, who is left at home? What, what prevented enemies from coming in from all directions and just helping themselves to whatever was still in the fields or whatever was in the houses? Yeah. Well, we know that from other records that not everybody went up to Jerusalem. It was the 20-year-old male, the males age 20 and above that were supposed, to, that were quote, required to go. Everybody went if they could, but it was the, so it was the, um, the older people and the children and the wives that could potentially be at home. Hezekiah and later Nehemiah went to this considerable lengths to try to restore the tithing system and the worship system that had been mostly forgotten. And you can read about that in extensive passages in 2 Chronicles 31, Nehemiah 12, and 13. Um, and they, they didn't waste time. They forcefully tried to get rid of the, the pagan worship and so forth, apparently to God's, with God's blessing. Today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church replaces that extensive process of traveling to Jerusalem by arranging for offerings to be collected by the local church to be forwarded through the conference system and a portion sent even to the general conference to be distributed worldwide. So today, when we have the opportunity, the ability to travel almost at will across the country. Mm -hmm. That's when we have this local system set up. Uh, oh, but not everybody can travel across the country. Remember that we now, in North America here, we are a small percentage of, of Adventism. We're by well, yeah. far the majority of Adventists do not live in North America. I'm talking about our system though. Yeah. Okay. What would happen to our church today if everyone decided to give their tithes to any person or organization they thought was appropriate? Would the church itself disappear? Well, you mean, we're all of us here are very familiar with the fact that there have been times when there have been great complaints about what the church was doing and various, uh, you know, ancillary groups, whatever you choose to call them, uh, would be calling for people to support them. There's, I'm sure that all of us here get requests all the time from from church organ from church groups um, that are doing special missions in some parts of the world or whatever. Please give to our organization and so forth. Yeah. So should that be a part of our tithe? That would be part of the question. Or is that part of our offerings? Okay. The paying of tithes is a recognition that we have nothing and that we are nothing apart from the Lord. He owns everything, Psalm 24, 1. God does not need our money, but we need this pr process of reminding us of our duty to him, and we need the benefit that comes from supporting the ministry. Dr. Luke had some interesting words as recorded in Acts 20, 35, that might apply. That would be mine, Acts 20, 35. Paul said, he's, 
Paul is speaking, I have shown you in all things that by working hard in this way, you must help the weak, remembering the words that the Lord Jesus himself said, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. And where does that come from? Acts 20, 35. Well, this verse is puzzled scholars because they have never found any other place recorded in the Bible of Jesus saying these words. Now, there are some other times when he has said something a little bit similar, so maybe Paul was just paraphrasing. Of course, John told us that all the books in the world cannot contain all the things that Jesus talked about. He said that in John 21, 25. So this should not be surprising. When you pay your tithe, do you recognize that that process makes you a partner with God? Do you give gladly? Are we only expected to pay our tithe when things are going well? Or will we still be required to pay our tithe at times like during the seven last plagues? I have worked in other parts of the world for many years and places where People bring their pumpkins and their squash and their corn and so forth like this and pots full of this and that to pay their tithe. How about during war? Yeah. How about in Ukraine now? Yeah. Or will we still be required to pay our tithes at times like during the seven last plagues? If we've been paying a faithful tithe on a regular basis and have come to trust God to care for us in all situations, could we continue to trust in God's care even if our lives are at stake? Revelation 13. What could that teach us? Verses 13 to 17. This second beast, now if you remember the buildup of things there in Revelation. We come to Revelation 13, well, Revelation 12 tells us clearly that there's a conflict going on. A conflict which began in heaven, has continued on in this earth, and all that Satan has done to try to destroy it. And then it talks about some associates, some cooperating agencies of, of the devil. And Revelation 13 basically talks about what the devil wants to do. And notice these scary words. This second beast performed great miracles. It made fire come down out of heaven to, to earth in the sight of everyone. And it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to breathe the life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. Wow. So if you read the whole context here, it says that these two beasts that it's talking about here are going to require people to worship whom? You remember? The beast. Well, but both of them are going to require you to worship the devil himself. If you look back and you trace it back, this beast and this beast. That is the devil. Yeah. yeah. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands and on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having the mark. That is, the beast's name of the number that stands for the name. And we have talked about that. What was that famous number? 666. 666. And where did that come from? You can get it in a variety of ways. A variety of ways. The more, probably the most ancient way is this, and many people don't know this. The ancients had, well, you know about the zodiac. There are 12 divisions of the zodiac. And the ancient Mesopotamian people, they had further divided each of those sections to three others. So there was a total of 36, and each of those had a, some kind of a god that you potentially could worship in it. And so there's 36 gods in the sky, they believed. And if you add those numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 up to 36, guess what you get? 360. 366. So that was their... 666. 600, I'm sorry. 666, we're correct. That was their code number for all their gods. Well, 
Malachi 3.10, which we read a little bit ago, promises us that if we pay a faithful tithe according to all the directions that God has given, we will be blessed abundantly. That abundance allows us to keep, help others and to support the work of God with offerings. Have you found that you have received a blessing by supporting the church with your tithes and offerings? What kind of blessings do you get from paying your tithes and offerings? that you could do it. Yeah. We have pastors who minister to us. They're paid by our tithes. We have churches that are built by our offerings. Aren't those blessings? They should be anyway. Sometimes yeah. we have physical blessings, but not everyone has health or wealth mm -hmm. who pays tithe. Yeah. Can you think of some examples from your own personal experience? And I'll let each one of you think about that for yourself. One of the challenging questions that people struggle with at times is whether we should tithe on our net or gross increase. Okay, Jim? The question of gross or net primarily involves whether we return tithe on our income before or after such taxes are taken out. Those who are self employed can legitimately deduct the cost of doing business in order to determine their actual profit before their personal ex taxes are deducted. Studies of membership giving habits, membership's giving habits, reveal that the majority of Seventh-day Adventists tithe on the gross income, that is, before taxes are taken out, or taken, yeah. In fact, according to the tithing principle and guidelines published by the General Conference in, eight, in 1990, the tithe should be computed on the gross amount of the wages or salary earner's income before a legally required or other employee authorized deductions. This includes federal and ta state tax income taxes, which are provided for service and other benefits of responsible citizenship. Contributions to Social Security may be subtracted. And okay. Does this, and so why is it that they allow you to contribute, I mean, to uh, deduct or subtract contributions to Social Security? Presumably because you supposedly are going to pay tithe when you get your Social Security payment Back later. Back out. That's right. So you're going to be tying, paying tithe on it later. Does this reference suggest to you that you should pay tithes on your gross income? It's pretty clear what the General Conference thinks you should do, doesn't it? One of the conditions that the Bible recommends regarding the paying of tithe is that it should be the first portion of our income to be set aside each pay period for support of the church and the ministry. That should be done before we use money for any other purpose. If we want, uh, I'm sorry, if we wait to pay our tithe until other expenses are covered, it is very easy to run out of money before we're able to pay our tithes. Does that ever happen? Wow. If you read 1 Kings 17, 9 through 16, about Elijah and the widow in Zarephath and her son, what can this teach us about paying tithes before using them, our money for any other purpose? Now, that's a bit of a stretch, that story, but what do we know about the story? Basically, Elijah said, make some bread for me, yeah. and then after I eat, then you can have some. Yeah, yeah. And the And the oil and the flour never ran out. Yep. I always wonder about that story. Um, I'm not questioning it, but the city of Zarephath, the small town of Zarephath is still there. It's right on the coast. So, I mean, does that mean they were, they, they, they were not able to get fish? They were not able to get anything out of the sea either? Um, anyway, wonder about that. So, uh, when asked about some of these issues, Ellen White said, from uh, everyone is to be his own assessor and is left to give as he purposes in his heart. Testimonies, Volume 4, 469. So do you pay your tithes faithfully because you consider it is, it is your duty? Or do you give gladly because you recognize that God is, a, is blessing you? Well... Him? 
I think this is your first. Okay, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. You should know, excuse me, you should think of us as Christ's servants who have been in, excuse me, put in charge of God's secret truths. The one thing required of such servants is that they be faithful to their master. Good News Bible. Then from the Bible study guide, what does it mean to be a faithful with your tithe? The week we have re reviewed several, excuse me, this week we have reviewed several of the constituent elements of the tithe. Number one is the amount, which is a tenth or 10% 10 of our income or increase. Number two, taken to the storehouse, the place from which the gospel ministers are paid. Number now three, let's, l let me interrupt there for a second. Um, who would be included in gospel ministers? Gets a little tricky. Should it be you, Bible teachers in schools? And the Should church it be has other teachers. The church has taken a stand that it can be used for Bible teachers because they believe they are doing a gospel a gospel ministry, which is a valid thing, I think. But not for other teachers and not for secretaries and other things like that. At least it's not supposed to be. But okay. in most elementary schools, it's the teachers that teach the Bible class, as well as all the other classes. Yes. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Number three, honoring God with the first part of our income. Number four, used for the pur right purpose of support of the ministry. It is responsibility as church members to uphold the first three items. It is the responsibility of the storehouse managers to make sure that the tithe funds are used properly. And, unlike our offerings, the tithe is not discretionary on our part. The tenth and the storehouse are both part of our responsibility. We don't set the parameters. God does. If I don't return a full 10% of my increase, I am not really tithing. And if I don't bring that 10% to the storehouse, I am not really tithing either. From the Bible study guide. Okay, we want to make these things very clear, don't we? How can we determine whether or not God is blessing us as He blessing us as He promised? That's a little bit tricky, isn't it? You, I remember the, and I've mentioned this story earlier, and I I, I will never forget it because it impressed me so much as a child. There was a story told about a man during the Great Depression, and he had one dollar left, and he became joined the Adventist church as well, I have to pay my tithe. And of course, he, like almost everybody else, was trying to look for a job. But he took his dollar to a store and got it changed, and he went down to the church and paid a dime in tithe. And he said, I don't know what he's going to do now with his few cents he has left. But he went home that night and prayed, and the next morning, despite all of his efforts, he hadn't, been a, hadn't gotten a job. The next morning, he got three job offers. And that was... the crowning witnesses that, that you, God will open the windows of heaven. Jesus told a very interesting parable discussing the differences between those who are faithful with their money and those who are not. Carrie? Uh, Matthew 25, 19 to 21. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The servant who had received 5,000 coins came in and handed over the other 5,000. You gave me 5,000 coins, sir, he said. Look, here are another 5,000 that I have earned. Well done, and you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. That's from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, as from Malachi 3.10, is God's command. No appeal is made to gratitude or to generosity. This is a matter of simple honesty. The tithe is the Lord's, and he bids us return to him that which is his own. That's from Mrs. White's education. Unfortunately, we sometimes hear people refusing to pay their tithes, 
or hear of them sending their tithes to another group or organization because they do not like the way the money is being used by some part of the church organization. The best answer that I can possibly think of is the story of the widow whom Jesus observed casting in her two small coins or marts, mites. And let's just look at those two passages quickly. Mark 12, 42, then a poor widow came along and dropped in two little copper coins worth about a penny. And it's that same stories in Luke 21. Those two mites, what was going to happen to them? Going to go to the Sadducees. They would have ended up in the hands of the Sadducees who were certainly did not need them. They were the richest people in the whole area. However, Jesus assured his disciples and us that she did the right thing. The issue is not what the organization does with the money. Now, that's a separate issue. It's something if, if the church is misusing its money or somebody in the church is misusing its money, that needs to be dealt with through other channels. But your relationship with God as you give is what matters as far as the tithing is concerned. Gordon? Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, said, If all the tithes of our people flowed into the treasury of the Lord as they should, such blessings would be received that gifts and offerings for sacred purposes would be multiplied tenfold, and thus the channel between God and man would be kept open. Wow. Then, tenfold. Then from the Bible Study Guide, this is an amazing statement. If we were all faithful tithers, God would bless us with funds to increase our offerings 1,000%. Whoa. Then again from Ellen White, this from Review and Herald in 1901. In the third chapter of Malachi is found the contract God ha has made with man. Here the Lord specifies the part he will act in bestowing his great gifts on those who will make a faithful return to him in tithes and offerings. Okay, on other, in previous lessons, we've talked about the reasons for the delay in the second coming. It's been 178 years, I think, now since the great disappointment. And why are we still here? Is partly, are we start, partly the reason is that we're not paying a faithful tithe? Could that be true? That's mm. what's suggested by that verse, that uh, quotation. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And then continuing, this is from Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 384. All should remember that God's claims upon us underlie every other claim. He gives us, he gives to us bountifully, and the contract which he has made with, uh, with man is that a tenth of his possessions shall be returned to God. The Lord graciously entrusts to his stewards his treasures, but of the tenth, he says, this is mine. Just in proportion as God has given his property to man, so man is to return to God a faithful tithe of all his substance. This distinct arrangements was, arrangement was made by Jesus Christ himself. Wow. So that's a pretty significant Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. White and years ago. Yep. We need to remember, of course, that we are God's property for multiple reasons. He created us. He sustains us. We've talked about that. He offers to save us. Even the strength we have both intellectually and physically to acquire wealth is given to us by God. Deuteronomy 8. Moses talking to the children of Israel camped on the plains of Moab there, ready to cross the, to, the, to cross the Jordan. So then you must never think that you have made yourselves wealthy by your own power and strength. Remember that it is the Lord, your God, who gives you the power to become rich. He does this because he is still faithful today to the covenant that he made with your ancestors. That's Deuteronomy 8. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord by making him an offering from the best of all that your land produces. And Matthew 6, 33, Jesus himself said, Instead, be concerned about, above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. Um, how much is included in all these other things? If we 
gave all our money to the church, would God take care of us? He I'm, has in some circumstances, at least. He has, yeah. yeah. You know, we we believe these messages. We They're in the Bible. There's no question about it. It's hard to know sometimes exactly how how literally we should take them. Shouldn't God's faithful tithe... So, question. If yeah. I'm a... If I'm a faithful Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. is it my responsibility to give this money to the Roman Catholic Church? If I'm a faithful Baptist, is it responsibility to give it to that church? Or LDS, mm -hmm. likewise? Mm -hmm. Or is it just to the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, I mean, you're, are you asking how, in, in, to receive God's blessing, you must give it to the church you're attending? Is that yeah. your question? Partly, yeah. yeah. And this, you know, it's re the responsibility of those in the storehouse to, to do the right thing with it. Well, is, does that, is that true and for all the other churches too? Yeah. Well, and what about the congregational churches where you pay your money in and uh, basically it pays for the pastor right there? Yeah. I think and some pastors who think about some of these mega churches, they're doing very well even though each individual person may not be paying that much. Well, um, shouldn't God's faithful tithe-paying people be the most blessed people in the world? So are we. Um, I, I, I read quite a lot of religious material, and there are stories that come out all the time of people who are blessed amazingly. Um, and... Does that mean we are blessed collectively or each one of us is blessed individually or both? I think it's a bit of both. When you mm -hmm. look at uh, what they're doing in Africa and some of these places and it's all planned out from here up near, uh, not far from where my son lives, up, up halfway up to California. Yeah. They take all the, uh, put bores down for water. Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff. Yep. Now, that takes finance and stuff. I can tell you, I, one of my responsibilities with one of the jobs I had in Africa was, was to either drill wells or repair them if they're broken. And I, I'll never forget the experience we had one time. We, we went and found out that the, one of the little pieces at the bottom of the well was one of the things wasn't working, so the well was no longer. And people had depended upon it. Hundreds of people were depending on that well. Yes. We pulled the thing out there and fixed it so it worked and put it down. Oh, why people were, I mean, it was just, imagine, people were just gathered around to get water from that well, like something. And, and building some of the new churches and, and schools and stuff in some of those mm -hmm. places, it all comes from finance like that. Well, there's some other verses that sometimes are misunderstood that we should mention briefly. Two temporary tithes that the Hebrews were expected to pay at one point in their history. One, the king's tithe, and two, a second tithe. Where are we here? I guess that's me, huh? The king's tithe. The king's tithe was a tax established in the days of Saul, 1 Samuel 8, 11, and 15, and 17. This tithe was not part of the covenant and ceased with the end of the Jewish monarchy. It was, I mean, it was to support the royalty, basically. And here's what, the, here's what it says. This is how your king will treat you, Samuel explained. They will make soldiers of your sons. Some of them will serve in his war chariots, others in his cavalry, and others will run before his chariots. He'll make some of them officers in charge of a thousand men and others in charge of 50 men. Your sons will have to plow his fields, harvest his crops, make his weapons and the equipment for his chariots. Your daughters will have to make perfumes for him and work as his cooks and his bakers. He will take your best fields, vineyards, and olive groves and give them to his officer, officials. He will take a tenth of your corn and of your grapes for his court officials and other officials. He will take your servants and your best cattle and donkeys and make them work for him. He will take a tenth of your flocks and yourselves will become, and you yourselves will become his slaves from the Good News Bible. Boy, that doesn't sound like a very appealing kind of a thing, does it? But don't we wish that taxes were only 10% today? Yeah. Okay, the second tithe. 
in Hebrew called the Maser Sheni, and Ellen White talks about it in Patriarchs of Prophets, 50, chapter 51. Thus, try this tithe ended with the destruction of the temple and the nation of Israel, as it depended on the seven-year cycle. What was the seven-year cycle? The, jub the Jubilee. Yeah, well, led up to the Jubilee, right. Which started only when the Israelites entered the Promised Land. It's interesting to notice that, what, that they were allowed to do with the, what they were allowed to do with those ties. Jim? Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 to 29. Set aside a tithe, tenth of all your fields produce each year. Then go to the one place where the Lord your God has chosen to be worshipped. And that would be Jerusalem, right? And there put in his presence, and there in his presence, eat the tithes of your corn, wine and olive oil, and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep. Do this so that you may learn to honor the Lord your God always. So does this mean we go to church and we celebrate together consuming our tithe? Now this is, what do we call it? This is a second tithe. This is not the main tithe which was to support the Levites. This is the second tithe. Okay, go ahead. And the place of your worship, excuse me, do this so that you may learn to no, honor if, the Lord. If the place of worship is too far, um, did you? I think I said. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So that, excuse me, do this so that you may learn to honor the Lord your God always. If the place of worship is too far from your home you for you to carry there the tithe of the produce that the Lord has blessed you with, then do this. Sell your produce and take the money with you to the one place of worship. Spend it on whatever you want, beef, lamb, wine, beer, and, and there in the presence of the Lord your God you shall excuse me, you and your families are to eat and enjoy themselves. Do not neglect the Levites who are in your town. Okay, hold on a second here. So if you're at the temple and you're enjoying your second tithe, who are you supposed to invite? Along with the Levites. Along with the beer and wine that you're consuming, you're supposed to invite your okay. pastor. Yes. So that's what, it, that's what it suggests. Well, remember you did, or excuse me, uh, Proverbs thirty-one. It says, uh, yeah. "Not wise to for legislators or kings to use alcohol because they might make rules and regulations or laws that are oppress the the needy." Mm -hmm. But uh, the, you could give wine to the poor so that they could uh, they forget, forget their, misery. their misery and remember their poverty no more. Mm -hmm. Well, how are we going to find that? So we're going to use the quotes from Deuteronomy 14. Okay. For the second tithe. That's, you know, so we, by, by, by so doing, we open saloons and finance them through the, the tithe. Well, uh, let's not get carried <laughs> away too far. <laughs> do not take These Levites, Levites have, if you, you always got to do that in connection with the pastor. Okay. Do not neglect the Levites who live in your towns. They have no property of their own. And the end of every year, bring the every tithes. Third year. End of every third year, excuse me. Bring your tithes to all your crops and store it in your towns. So this food is for the Levites, since they own no property, and for the foreigners, orphans, and the widows who live in your town. They are to come and get all they need. Do this, and the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Good news, Bible. Wow. The second part. Excuse me, the second tithe was spent by the family on the annual visit to the sanctuary. The exception to this practice occurred during the third and sixth years of the seventh year cycle, seven year cycle, when the second tithe was saved at home in, to provide a feast and assistance to those who didn't work, own land on the, that is the Levites, foreigners, widows, and orphans, Deuteronomy 14, 28, and 29. As such, the second tithe wasn't taken to the storehouse and it was not a ministerial tithe. See Fred Solnick. Okay, so this is extracted from or Bible. quoted from Encyclopedia Judaica um, and is quoted in our Bible study guide. There was also the ministerial tithe and that's of course the main tithe we're talking about. Um, 
Ministerial tithe is different from the other two tithes mentioned above. Unlike the king's tithe and the second tithe, the ministerial tithe remains in perpetuity until the gospel mission is completed. At that point, all nations will see that God's people are blessed and many of the nations will have accepted the good news of salvation. The ministerial tithe is independent of the Levitical system and is part of the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is that of Jesus. And it gets a little complicated here. Is this still talking about the Levitical tithe or not? So this is all from the Bible study guide. Yeah. Moreover, there is no Bible reference indicating the end of the ministerial tithe. The text in Hebrews 7, 12 does not point to the end of the system of tithing, but to the end of the law of the Levitical priesthood, which was now replaced by the priesthood of Melchizedek. Uh, just like the Sabbath worship and a relationship with others, the duty of the tithe remains unchanged for those who accept the divine covenant. Look at six, six practices of, of tithing. We're going to have to look at this very quickly. The entire ministerial tithe should be taken to the storehouse. Money was scarce in the ancient Middle East, thus there was an emphasis on tithes and offerings to be taken to sanctuary and goods and animals. The tithe doctrine is based on all of Scripture, not only Levitical. Con considering the size of the depositories in the tabernacle, the temple, it would be unrealistic to imagine that the tithes of that entire nation given goods and animals would fit in the sanctuary depositories and so forth. Um, furthermore, the reference in the Bible to agriculture, produce, and animals is only an allusion to the most common products. However, the tithe could be converted to money when convenient. There's a couple of passages, including one we just read. And again, this is more, these are all outlines taken from Jewish writings um, that elucidate these things into more detail. Moreover, the Bible section dealing with tithing of agriculture produce establishes that tithes can be exchanged for money, as we've already read. Do you have any questions about the use of the tithe? What did the Levites do at times when the children of Israel were unfaithful in paying their tithes? Are we as Seventh-day Adventists looking forward to the near coming of Jesus Christ and wanting to hasten it? Paying a faithful tithe should be one way in which we could speak, speed God's work. Um, if you want to read the rest of this handout, you'll have to look at our website at theox.org. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of learning more. <clears throat> we have uh, got into quite a bit of detail in this lesson. Help us to understand how to interpret it and how to apply it so that we may receive the blessings that you have promised. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.